William Blackstone was the author of a four-volume textbook on English law. Okay, well, I'm Wilfred Prest. I'm uh, a historian. Uh, I used to have a lot of difficulties about saying that, but I think probably I can say now I am a historian. Certainly the most influential law book in the English language, arguably even the most influential law book of all time. Blackstone is now being cited by counsel and the judiciary in the US Supreme Court at a rate that is only equaled by his citation in the early 19th century. So there's been a huge resurgence of interest. He's the, really the starting point to which you go if you want to understand what the common law was when the United States became a, an independent country. But, but also Blackstone has statements about individual human rights which are still of considerable relevance. The first volume of the Commentaries on the Laws of England came out in November 1765. That's 249 years from now. Next year is the 250th anniversary of the first uh, appearance of, of the Commentaries. I, I think it was uh, the historian Gibbon who said mm. that uh, the common law was once the horror of all men of taste. Yes, yes, indeed, yes. What, what did that mean? Well, I think it meant that the common law was a barbarous mess. It was n presented in a jargon, a mixture of Latin and Norman French and bits of English thrown in and presented as a collection of uh, procedures which were necessary to obtain uh, remedies for injuries uh, suffered. But the, the links, the coherence between these various uh, remedies, forms of action is a technical term, uh, was not at all clear that because these things had all grown up over a long period of time, very long period of time, and uh, it was all buried within the workings of the legal profession. Blackstone provided an overview which presented the law as a rational and a efficient and socially based uh, code of conduct, means of regulating social relations. Blackstone actually says himself in book three, the law is like the Gothic castle. It's got all sorts of strange anomalies, but when you actually look at how they work, you realize that despite all the incrustations and oddities, there is a perfectly habitable set of apartments within this gothic exterior encrusted with all these fictions and uh, uh, odd procedures and this was done in an extremely literate and compellingly well written mm -hmm. prose. He tinkered, he was a wordsmith, he tinkered with his text to get it right, to get it clear. When Blackstone starts, announces his course of lectures he, he announces them as fee-paying lectures. If you want to go to these lectures, you've got to, you've got to pay six guineas a, a year, I think, was the, was the sum. He wanted to appeal to the widest possible audience. And so he, from the very start, said these lectures were not intended to go into the minute details which would be necessary for someone preparing to become a practicing lawyer, uh, although they'd be useful as, a, as an introduction, but they were uh, as, as much intended for those who wanted a general map there were a contemporary actor mm. who would play Blackstone. Who would it be? One of the things about Blackstone is that he's a rather chubby chap. You can see in that, 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 that image, he, he doesn't have a lean and hungry look about him exactly. He is described sometimes as being, as being a bit overbearing. I suppose Orson Welles might be the person you would have to, you'd have to think about. How is Blackstone's life and work like the treasure of the Sierra Madre? His quest is for justice. He believes that 
the English law has as its aim justice, but that the law as he encountered it was such a mess, such a jumble, it was very hard to see that it was in fact serving the ends of justice. He believed that his re restatement of the law would indeed help to achieve that, um, that end. But I think also it's important to look at Blackstone's own life story. He's a posthumous son. His father dies um, before he's born. Uh, his father dies leaving a very large debt uh, he, from his business as a silk merchant in uh, London's Cheapside uh, to his mother, who has to try and trade her way out of this. Uh, she dies before Blackstone's uh, 12 years old. A lot of Blackstone's achievement comes from a drive to, as it were, justify himself to, to show that he's in a way better than his father. Was he changed by that quest? I think he became a more tolerant person. I think as a young man he might have been a bit of a prig. He was a tremendously um, high achiever at school. He was a scholarship boy at a very good London school, the Charterhouse. He topped the entire school by the age of 15. He probably wasn't terribly popular with his peers and some people thought that he could be uh, quite an obnoxious person by insisting upon his what he thought was right. Um, but I think in particular his religious attitudes became more tolerant. I also think he became increasingly concerned about the state of the uh, English criminal law. He was not happy about the reliance on capital punishment as the ultimate sanction and he is actually uh, responsible for the first legislative enactment in England of a system of penal justice through through prison. It was uh, quite, a, quite a significant achievement and, and, a, and a reflection of a, a growing humanity, if you like. How is Blackstone's life or legacy like mutiny on the bounty? <laughs> well, I don't see Blackstone in a particularly maritime role, but he, there is certainly a uh, rivalry plot which commences with the attendance of the young Jeremy Bentham as a student at his last uh, set of, uh, of law lectures in Oxford before he publishes the commentaries which are based on these lectures. And the young Jeremy Bentham, who was a, an extremely clever uh, and ambitious uh, young man, if you wanted to engage in a bit of, uh, as you call, psychosocial analysis, uh, Blackstone becomes a sort of father figure against which the young uh, Jeremy, Jeremy stages an Oedipal uh, rebellion. Let me men again, we hang for it! Bentham uh, presents in 1776, the year of the American Revolution, he presents uh, his case against, Black or his first indictment against uh, Blackstone, a short piece called The Fragment on Government, which consists of a scarifying analysis of the opening pages of book one of the commentaries, prefaced by a more wide-ranging but uh, less intensive attack on other aspects of, of the book. Bentham's case is basically that Blackstone is simply uh, justifying the status quo, that he's got no interest whatever in reforming the law, which Bentham says with considerable justification is amiss, um, and that all Blackstone is doing is whitewashing and saying that everything that exists is as good as it could possibly be, if not better. Um, this is a caricature and total distortion, but it's a very effective uh, caricature. Casting me adrift, 3,500 miles from a port of coal, you're sending me to my doom, eh? Well, you're wrong! He believes in gradual change. Bentham, uh, after about 1800, becomes what we would call a radical. He wants fundamental change. He thinks the structure is so rotten it must be uh, destroyed entirely and replaced with something altogether new. Blackstone doesn't want to do that. Bentham's recipe 
uh, for change was actually rather less successful than Blackstone's. And codification in a the sort of sweeping way that Bentham advocated it has not been a great success story. Blackstone is uh, responsible for setting up in his college, All Souls College, not only the, the great Codrington Library, which was standing there as a shell when he arrived, he was responsible for finishing it, furnishing it, setting it up as a working library, which it still is today, but he was also responsible for the fact that beneath that library there was a, a very extensive cellar system. He populated these, this, this cellar with wine bottles and he arranged for the wine to be bought in bulk, to be bought in barrels, and then bottled in the college. He was, um, he, he was pretty keen on the wine himself. Boswell's Life of Johnson, I think, uh, refers to the fact that Blackstone composed his commentaries with a bottle of port at his elbow. This statement caused some concern to Blackstone's family. After his death, they remonstrated with uh, James Boswell, who changed the wording and said that he made temperate use, temperate use of port to uh, main t keep up his energy, really, while he was engaged in the throes of literary composition. That's fair enough, that's a, as it may be, but if you look at the inventory that was taken at his death, the contents of Sir William's cellar were not inconsiderable. This was special. This is a uh, copy of the first edition that is still untrimmed in the original uh, pasteboard boards. That's, this is really how the commentaries looked when it came away from the printer out of the, and was sold. People would have these rebound. You know, they would be trimmed, uh, but this is the way it originally worked. There's only two other copies in the uh, world that we know of. Uh, there's one at uh, the Law Library at Berkeley, and one in the special collections at the University of uh, uh, at SUNY Buffalo. Uh, but it doesn't get more original than that. No. And this is also has a great provenance. This is from the collection of uh, Bradley Martin, uh, one of the great American book collectors of the 20th century. What I'd like to do now is ask you some unusual questions. Yes, of course. Yes, and I let's know you do that. Yes. <laughs> yes. I've seen some of your videos. Right. Yes. Good. So, yes. so we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what we can do with this. Oh, sure. sure.